the diamond I realized the that I have to be careful. This is one time I had my eyes wearing The Empathy Museum presents A Mile in My Shoes. So the flip-flops I'm holding in my hand are a light shade of blue and have a black rubbery thong and sole. The bit where you place your foot is light blue and they look quite comfy and perfect for hot weather. These are quite small, they're a size 5 and they could be worn by either a man or a woman. These flip-flops belong to Jeremy Smith. This is his story. My name is Jeremy Smith. I work at Rio Tinto. I'm part of their community investment team. A couple of days after I was born, mum, I think, was holding me in the hospital and she noticed that um, a couple of my... She noticed that I had quite short and chubby fingers and she noticed that a couple of my fingers were actually bent and she was asking the, the nursing staff there why that might have been and and she was told that, you know, it was because I was probably the position I was in in her womb and, and the, the process of birth and everything like that, but everything would, would work out okay in, in the end and so on. When she was home with me, feeding me and everything like that, obviously the child health nurse would drop in to say hi and make sure the both of us were doing okay. Mum again said, you know, if his fingers still aren't quite right and he was, she was starting to notice that... My head was quite large in comparison with the rest of my body. And it was about when I was six weeks old, I think that mum and dad went and saw an obstetrician. And so that was when they found out that I had a chondroplasia. And that was a bit of a shock to them. And they didn't really know what that meant. And in layman's terms, I guess a chondroplasia is a dwarf. I think the words that mum and dad used at the time were devastated. They didn't really know anything about that at that stage. And so all their friends and family did a lot of research and... Um, investigations about what that meant. And my grandparents' mums, mum and dad at that stage, were based in Darwin. Their investigations led them to a local doctor. And um, the, the doctor said to them that, amongst other things, make sure that that boy never has children. Um, I don't know, that was just disgusting. And I think mum and dad felt absolutely bereft by that. One of the earliest memories I have actually is um, a time when my dad, we, dad and I went on a big trip into the city on this one day and um, involved going on a bus and, and going into town, as we called it, and he took me to the movies. And it was not long after my um, little sister was born, I think, so it was one of those things, so some man time with dad. And um, I was probably only four years old or whatnot at the time, and I think I remember standing in line with dad and doing the whole popcorn thing and going in to see the movie and the lights went down and the movie that he had taken me to see was Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And um, there's a whole backstory as to why he'd chosen that. I think it was something that he thought, or he and mum both thought it was uh, something I could relate to and it was just sort of a, a nice fun thing that was on at the time. I think I lasted probably not even 15 minutes. So before the first hi-ho was sung, I was off and running and um, bawling my eyes out and dad had to evacuate the cinema, the poor thing. So... <laughs> The fact of being a person that has grown up with the contraplasia, it has taught me a lot about morals and a lot about behaviour and a lot about how to treat people. I was a bit of a regular down at Sunday sessions at either the cot or the left bank in sort of my 20s. And I remember this one Sunday session, I was at the left bank with a group of friends and um, it was quite late. I'd had a few drinks, I'd had it, as had everyone else. And out of the blue, I remember behind me, all of a sudden, this guy put his head between my legs and lifted me straight up onto his shoulders. And I almost sort of immediately fell backwards off him. But instead of falling off him, I fell onto another one of his mates. And at which point he started basically crowd surfing me. Because the beer garden was quite full at that stage. And... It all happened within such an instant and I just remember my friends sort of looking at me and then all of a sudden they were gone and all I could see was sort of the trees and the sky above me because I was then being passed around on top of all these blokes and girls as well across the beer garden. The next thing I remember I was just literally hoisted up in the air and then fell right next to a limestone fence and almost cracked my head open but luckily missed it by inches. Then sort of got up and dusted myself off and uh, found a few of my friends that had wondered what the hell had happened to me and saw me basically on the far end of the beer garden. And um, 
I felt bad because there were a few people that I saw that I had actually injured on my way through <laughs> with feet and, and whatnot. There was a, a poor girl there that had quite a bloodied nose so I, and I was just too, I think, in shock more than anything else. So I just sort of left and went home because I just really couldn't comprehend that people had done something like that. So one of my earliest career um, moves was with a, a local theatre company called Barking Gecko Theatre Company. They're a theatre company that work, uh, produce work for young people, children and young people. And um, I had sort of a dual role one year with one of their productions during the Perth Festival, which was, I was sort of a stage manager as well as a, a performer. And pre-show, there was a um, opportunity where the members of the cast mingled with members of the audience, i.e. children, that were making sand castles that related to the show that they were about to see. And I was wandering around down um, on the Matilda Bay foreshore and um, there was this, this one uh, performance, there was this one girl who <laughs> never really let up about me being a person with a contraplasia. She followed me around and sort of said, look at that fat man, look at that little funny man, look at him, look at him, look at him. And so I just thought, okay, we've got to nip this in the bud because otherwise it's going to go on all night. So I sort of went over to her and sort of said, now tell me a story about your castle. And she sort of said, I don't want to talk about my castle, I want to talk about why you're a fat, funny little man. And I took the opportunity to just whisper in her ear and said, well, because when I was a little boy... One time I asked a boy that looked like me that very same question and the next morning I woke up looking like this. <laughs> and the poor, the poor thing, I wouldn't, that's so out of character for me to do something like that. <laughs> but she just screamed and I think her parents had to take her away after that because, you know, <laughs> I think I terrified that poor girl and I would have loved to have been a fly on her wall the next morning when she woke up and probably looked at herself in the mirror to see if the... Short, fat little man was right. <laughs> you know, growing up, obviously, everyone always used to sort of say, oh, haha, look at that funny little boy or look at that funny little man. And more recently, I find myself, you know, carve loads full of young men and women screaming at me, taking photos. I've even been sitting outside a cafe at one stage in Sorrento and had an orange thrown at me. I guess when I go to some places, I psychologically prepare myself for stuff people might say or do or anything like that. But when you're at a family event and you just see families encouraged by parents and children sort of actively making fun of me and who I am, that's just what gets me to the core every time. And I just get so angry and ropeable and I just can't understand that there are people out there that would let firstly let their children behave like that but let alone encourage it and you know the the older people are they start sort of relating more to pop culture and refer me to or compare me I should say to Wee Man or you know from um, Jackass or Tyrion from Game of Thrones and, and start making jokes you know can you kick yourself in the head dude and and all that sort of stuff and um and that continues to this day I've sort of uh, had instances where I've just been walking down the mall of Perth CBD, like Hay Street Mall or Murray Street Mall, and um, I will see middle-aged people just pulling out their phones and taking a photo of me. And I guess, you know, I'm prepared for that sort of thing, but I know that sometimes when I've been out as a group with all my friends and work colleagues, when it happens in a social environment like that, that sometimes rattles me, I think. Not because of how it affects me, but how it affects the people I'm with. I don't think that they're sort of used to experiencing that. I mean, my, co my close friends are, and they're fantastic about it and will you know, defend me to the nth degree and so on and tell people to where to go if they sort of see people doing it. But, you know, I do know that it makes other people feel uncomfortable when they're in my presence and they see that sort of behaviour and I, that I feel for them more than I do for, for, for me and, and, you know, I think that just sort of sometimes really gets me down. But, you know, I think in terms of what I have to deal with, that's nothing in comparison, you know, on the spectrum of what some people have to deal with every day in their life, the things that I deal with are sort of so molecular you know, it's just, ask me a question for goodness sakes. And even if it's your kids, you know, that are sort of seeing me or someone like me for the first time, don't scold them. Encourage them to ask me a question about why I am who I am, you know, get educate them. That's the thing that will make them realise and appreciate the, the beauty of diversity and difference in our society and so on. 
that's the thing, even yourself, if you sort of rather than smirk at me or take a photo of me or something like that, say, what's it like being you, dude? I'll tell you a story or three. <laughs> Jeremy's story was produced by Marnie Richardson. His shoes are part of a growing collection of footwear hosted by the Empathy Museum's A Mile in My Shoes exhibition. The shoes and stories come from all over the world. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram to find out where we're going next. <laughs>